No, skepticism is awesome. It's, there you like go. A, <laughs> it's a superpower. It's like you can see the matrix code. Good what morning. I find funny about this, I, we get this countdown thing. So here's, here's a, the difference between like Dragon Con and New Year's Eve. A Dragon <laughs> Con, when the, the countdown timer starts, everybody gets quiet, like dead quiet, until like, you know, and then they wait for us to say anything. If it's New Year's Eve, it's like everybody's like, 30! Just like, why is that 29? Which, really? <laughs> People just stream at any time. It's just funny. So the thing I found in our track room that today that I had to like mention, because there's always something interesting that ends up at the skeptic track room. Last year was sex in the hallway. And today was somebody said in a, a, a stack of, what is a furry? <laughs> <laughs> Sexually, sexual deviancy and how it can far, and harm and harm. It's not just a hobby. It's a lifestyle. And now look out for the warning signs that your kids might be, you know, being seduced by furries. <laughs> does, it, does, it, does it have in there what furry sex is called? I unfortunately do know this information. Someone told me on the way down it's called yipping. Really? Yes. Oh, okay. And there was a T-shirt that I saw that I took a picture. Of I don't know. The other guy that. Oh, oh. <laughs> so in case, in case. Now there's there are warning code words for events that your that your children might be asking you for money to go to. Anthrocon, conifer, fur fest, the further convention. Yeah, the anti furry furry coalition. I, I bet you anything that those anti furry track like that actually promotes <laughs> the furries. Yes, I'm sure. People who have no idea what it is will read that and go, that looks interesting. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's banned? <laughs> Where can I find it? These, these uptight people don't like it? But that, I wonder why. It's just crazy. <laughs> Playful or disgusting. 90% of furry fans That's admit. Your choice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is just entertaining more than anything. <laughs> Are they harmless or corrupt? <laughs> yeah. Some people find anything to, like, really get their lather up about. Or not. It's yeah. just bizarre. It really yeah. is. It's not Westboro Baptist, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> I, you know, those people know better than to come. They came to Dragon Con about three years ago. It's like the year... Wait a minute, not the year you, maybe the year before you started to come. We were here two and three years ago, so yeah. Yeah, because they came, and yeah, the Dragon Con people, the, the attendees didn't want to have anything to do with it, and they basically, you know, did their counter, counter protest was very entertaining. You know, they had their f signs, but they just made no sense, you know. Like, what were they protesting? Stop having fun? I mean, <laughs> yeah. No, I guess because. Stop enjoying well, yourselves. Because there's always. Yeah. Well, Dragon Con is a lot of the. What they think is Devency stuff. Like, they have a lot yeah, of, right. like, like gray stuff. Or that. Last night, oh, yeah. right after Georgia's show, they were setting up the BDSM mm -hmm. thing and all that. So that's the stuff that they. Yeah. Right, right. yeah. Deviancy. Yeah. yeah. So, well, you know, I can tell you all about Devency is right here. <laughs> <laughs> These people look. Look, the, look, these people are having fun being furries. Look f out for this. <laughs> yeah, th this, this is, this is for the... This is, this oh, no, they left a stack of it. I got rid of, rid of, rid of, rid of, rid of uh, most of them. They took away the trash, but I just I oh, kept it one. There, it was in this room. Oh, yeah. So somebody must have done it during the day you know, the, yesterday. The people, that, the people that make those trash really just sort of abbreviate it. If you see someone having fun... It's wrong. Yeah. Well, yeah, look, I mean, half of the, like, oh, wait, like no, wait a second. these people are smiling and having fun. Okay, let, me, let me take a look at this. I think Steve's right, and not having looked at this until just this moment. This is probably done by the pros. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, no, yeah, okay, now, 
th this photograph here showing the, the two f uh, furries having fun, they really are having fun. They're just posing and they're being silly. Anybody looking at that picture is going to laugh. Okay. If I were going to be producing propaganda against something, um, I would probably not use this type of, of, uh, of artwork, you'd make them look more demonic, you'd make them look, you know, th this, this is by the good guys, you know, th it's this is satirical, by people. Yeah. yeah, it's satirical. But it shows you um, that the... It's not the Westboro Baptist, it's um, Landover. Landover Baptist. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we... We we will we will have this we will have this for your uh, consideration uh, after the program is over. Right. But but please don't take it away. It deserves to be shared. <laughs> that's why I had to keep it. Right. I just had to keep it. It's yeah, just, that's delightful. I, I was a good, it's good stuff like that. I always find a good dis discussion piece because, like you just said, it's a. Yeah, it's one of those things. Like, yeah, we often don't know. Is it is that real or is that satire? But yeah, it's, it's hard to tell. But the other side's often beyond satire. They're well, so the ridiculous sometimes. Is, yeah, know, the better it yeah. is, the harder it is to tell. The harder that, it is to tell. That's what makes Landover Baptist so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's so much fun. <laughs> we we still at NCSE. I'm Eugenie Scott, National Center for Science Education. We deal with the creationism and evolution controversy. Um, and uh, we, you know, a at least once a year, sometimes more frequently, we get an outraged uh, email from somebody who's seen the creation science parody on Landover Baptist. Um, oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, we, we, we have, we very gently write them and saying, well, actually, this is a spoof site, and, and they're, they're not really promoting creation science fairs. The creation science fair um, uh, page that they have on there is hilarious. I mean, <laughs> but, but again, it's just written just so close to the edge. You, you could imagine yeah. some Unfortunately. You know, religious conservatives having a creation science fair like this and just these crazy things. But um, what we, we write a gentle note saying, well, no, actually, and look around a little bit more. For example, look on their sales page. You know, the, the, the whole notion of, of chastity thongs <laughs> should tell you that these people are not totally serious. I mean, right. Anyway, it's... Um, we, got a, we got email <laughs> alerting us to a site, a, a science denial site, about a group that denied the existence of the moon. <laughs> and had no elaborate argument. The moon is a conspiracy. And they, they thought it was serious. But it, and it's, you always got to read like a couple paragraphs in before you're deciding, is this real or... Is, it was a spoof site. It was hilarious. Please actually. tell me, was that before or after Despicable Me was in the theaters? Uh, it was before. Oh, damn. Yeah, it was before. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was hilarious, though. But, yeah, you don't really... The reveal, the real hardcore reveal is until you get deep into it, where they start yeah. to get more and more ridiculous. It was funny. It's like some of the heliocentrist people. Yeah. You know, if you start to dig in around, you're like, you just... Get, I don't know for sure, mm -hmm. but you, gotta, you have to imagine. <clears throat> they're just having fun with it, because there's no way. Yeah. Well, then well, there's time actually, cube. You know, actually, actually... Um, uh, a very famous skeptic, whom, who is not known as well by modern-day skeptics, alas, uh, Bob Shadowalt. Oh, oh we had his wife on our show. Yeah, Lois, uh, yeah. Who, who edited that wonderful book of Bob's writings, um, available, and, and you should look into it, because Bob was really great. But he worlds was of science, their own. Worlds of their own, yes. Yeah. Bob was interested in a number of kind of kooky things. Uh, we met because one of his interests was creationism, and he was on my board of directors for a while. Uh, he died of cancer um, in his six, in his fifties, much too young, but uh, and he's missed. But one that. of the topics that Bob was an expert on was the flat Earth Society yeah. and the geocentric movements. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the um, the flat Earth uh, people are even more out there than the yeah. geocentrists. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, really, uh, it's. It, but Bob was, very, was, was actually uh, quite, quite good friends uh, with um, Charles K. Johnson, who was a, uh, until his death in his 70s, in the early 2000s, I think 2002, he was the uh, founder and chairman of the International Flat Earth Research Society. Research. Which was a serious flat earth organization. Um, Bob has written on this, and, and basically, flat earthism was was a uh, an interesting Victorian uh, enthusiasm, shall we say? And there were uh, several organizations in Great Britain at the at the end of the 19th century. In fact, a very famous um, 
uh, tale in the Annals of Evolution has to do with um, uh, Henry Wallace, uh, not Henry Wallace, um, <laughs> um, Alfred Russell Wallace. Thank you. <laughs> Henry Wallace. That's why, that's why they have Alf <laughs> Yeah, that's why I have brain, a brain here next to me. Uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, who was uh, a co-discoverer of the, of the theory of natural selection, um, who got in a uh, contest, uh, a, a scientific test of whether the Earth was spherical or whether it was flat, with a prominent uh, flat earther in the 1880s. I mean, this all seems really quite remarkable. He lost the bet, by the way, but you know, I mean, he won it scientifically. He lost it because the guy I cheated him. That's a sad story. But the uh, Mr. Johnson was a 20th century um, dedicated flat earther, and his wife Marjorie lived, uh, was from Australia, and she uh, she had an, an affidavit that she had signed and <clears throat> had had uh, notarized by a notary public that when she was in Australia, she did not hang by her feet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just further further evidence to convince you that the Earth is is actually flat. Mm -hmm. But Bob would uh, periodically uh, go and visit uh, Mr. Johnson, who lived in um, in Eastern California on the California Nevada border, which I've always thought might have been part of the reason why he thought the world was shaped the way it was. <laughs> but um, because if you ever go to um, you know, that part of, Cal of California, it's you can see very far yeah. <laughs> one direction. Um, but they're, you know, they're, they're, I don't think there's any serious flat earthers today after the demise of Mr. Johnson. Um, but geocentrism actually, uh, th there are some serious geocentrists. There also mm -hmm. are some fake sites. Yeah. And, yeah. and that, that's the skeptical part, you know, that trying to yeah. sort out the, the two. But um, in modern creationism, in fact, there is something of a resurgence of geocentrism, except it's <clears throat> they use kind that. of a neo geo, if you will. Yeah, well, they uh, use that. That well, if you put the Earth here, any everything in the universe could go around it. It's exactly, like, oh, okay. Exactly. It's re it, relativity is sort of folded in yeah. here. Yeah, <clears throat> there's no up and down. And, and time time distortion gets in there. Oh, oh, oh yeah. So so actually, the universe really is billions of years old, which ha ha is a good way to handle the problem of light coming here from yeah. you know, millions and billions of light years away. But the little sphere just around Earth in our solar system, um, the you know, uh, light and time slow down when you get to uh, the center of the universe, which is us. And therefore, uh, it's the Bible is true that the Earth is only 6,000 years old. I see. Wow, that's... So the Earth is 6,000 years old, but the universe is not. Correct. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> well, they have a DeLorean. You just, we're, we're, we, you just haven't kept up with the latest creation science research. Yeah, really. The Earth is like a DeLorean. If you put like a flux of packs around the back of it, so, <laughs> it's just crazy. So I had you guys here because I think, Steve, you've never done one of these. I don't think so, no. I've no. never done one of these. Uh, you haven't done it either, which is okay. good. So It's good because, you know, I like to do new people. So, Steve, you're... Now you've been, now you're like an official in the JREF, right? I'm a senior fellow at the JREF, that's right. What, is that, what, what does that entail? Uh, I'm, I'm essentially in charge of the JREF's science-based medicine outreach. So that they recognize that pseudoscience in the medical field is a very serious you know, uh, project for the skeptical movement, and they want to really uh, put a lot of their effort there. So they tap me to, to essentially head that for the, for the JREF. And that's still an evolving position. You know, DJ and I are talking about exactly what he wants me to do for them. But you know, for the moment, I'm starting to contribute blogs to their website, and uh, the, J the JREF is sponsoring the science-based medicine website along with, with my organization, the New England Skeptical Society, and uh, doing a lot of press outreach. You know, doing there's, there's a lot of actually medically themed. Um, Million dollar challenges. I'm actually working with them on one right now. Oh, very cool. Uh, and yeah, and, and we'll <coughs> we'll try to figure out what else we can do. I mean, it's all there's it's definitely an area where there where the battle is pitched. You know, unlike say the geocentrists. You know, where I think <laughs> may, I don't know if we How could about quite the furry people. We, or the furry. Yeah, we could, there are certain boxes where yeah, okay, we're, we've pretty much marginalized. You could never say eradicate. You never eradicate a weird belief, but you could at least marginalize them to the point where you don't have to worry about them too much. But uh, there, are, uh, there are some battlegrounds, like creation evolution, at least in this country, and, and definitely, uh, I think, you know, the science of medicine, where th we're in a pitched battle and not necessarily winning. You know? so, th yeah. so that's the areas where I think we need to put our efforts.
Very cool. And for everybody who doesn't know, so how did you get into the skeptical movement? Uh, I got into the skeptical movement in 1996 when I, when I founded with uh, my brother Evan and Perry the New England Skeptical Society and essentially we just were all fans of Skeptical Inquirer and you know the whole the skeptical movement as it existed back then and you know one day Perry looking in the back said look there's like these 40, 50 regional skeptical groups and there's nothing in New England so there's a, there's a huge void sucking us in. Um, so we started a group and then you know we, we did what skeptical groups did back then uh, which was you know hold meetings, publish a newsletter, do investigations. It was a, it was a, you know, a lot of good work but it was very uh, small in scope because you know we were a small you know, three or four people. Yeah. yeah, three or four people working, you know, in our living room, you know, in addition to our day jobs. And uh, as you know, like, you know, 2004, 2005 comes around, Web 2.0 is really hitting, pot the, the term podcast gets coined, and suddenly we have blogs and podcasts and our reach magnified by orders of magnitude. Now yeah. suddenly the movement was transformed in, in, in at that time. Before then, yeah. There, I don't know how much you want to get into the history of the skeptical movement on this talk, but <laughs> before that time, there was like there were three national groups. You know, there was the Skeptic Society, which is essentially Michael Shermer's group. And they're new, group. really. There was, huh? So the Skeptic Society is pretty new. When you yeah, think they were about pretty it. new yeah. at that time. I mean, the JREF was new at that time too, like yeah. in 1999, 2000. Yeah. They were pretty new, and it's, and then uh, Psycop now as CSI. Psychop, um, I'm also a fellow of Psychop, by the now, way. Now, Psychop is like the oldest one, I think. They were, yeah, like in the 70s, 75, yeah. I think they were founded. Okay. Carl Sagan and Randy and a bunch of people founded that one. Well, yeah, Martin, I Martin mean. Gardner. Martin Gardner. Martin Gardner, uh, yeah, James Randy, um, I think Isaac Kurtz. Asimov, Sagan. Sagan, yeah. And then Kurtz is the one that really took that group and turned it from like getting together and having tea to let's have an actual organization. And he basically founded Psychop and the Secular Humanist. And they were the, they were the show for 25, 30 years. Yeah. And, but then, you know, then there started the, the sort of grassroots aspect of the skeptical movement started to really take off, and they didn't quite know what to do with it, so there really was never any top-down organization, and there was no horizontal organization. It was, I think Shermer used the term herding cats, you know, to refer to the yeah. skeptical movement. That's pretty much what it was. So there was really no mechanism of organization. We we're all pretty much doing our own things. Maybe we'd run into each other at meetings, which was great. But that was it. But again, that, that, that's why I say Web 2.0 totally transformed the skeptical movement because suddenly the, the, we didn't need any top-down organization. We just yeah. had, we had organization just spontaneously arise out of the ether. And, uh, you know, we all could communicate to each other. We had a vibrant virtual community online and it just took off. It obviously was just there waiting to be tapped into. Yeah. Well, actually, <clears throat> the lack of top-down was deliberate. Yeah, I know. Because yeah. in the um, in the 70s and early 80s, of course, you know there were the lawsuits yeah. by Yuri Geller and so forth. When the Bay Area Skeptics yeah. got started, which was 1981, which wasn't that long after the founding of Psychop, um, it was, and the Bay Area Skeptics was the first of the local uh, skeptics organizations to form. Um, they were, of course, in close contact with Kurtz and, yeah. and the rest of the gang, and it was made very clear, you know, that. They thought it was great that Bay Area Skeptics was forming. They thought it was wonderful that there was this regional group, but it could not have any kind of formal relationship right. with the national because of the problem of lawsuits. Yeah. It was um, absolutely the Uri Geller effect, yeah. They, they, and, and more than that, because yeah. I remember Bay Area Skeptics got in trouble with something they published. Yeah. This is actually when I wasn't in the right? area at the time. Um, they got in trouble with uh, somebody in Hawaii, a psychic <laughs> in Hawaii that was you know, threatening to sue. And so uh, because the people on the other side of skepticism, yeah. as it were, the various purveyors of, of uh, Wu, um, were often, like Uri Geller, very quick to sue. Uh, the decision was made that we better not have ties among each other. Mm -hmm. Because this would, uh, it, <clears throat> I run a nonprofit, so I, I think in terms sometimes of, of nonprofit law, nonprofit organization. Yeah. If you have ties between two organizations, um, in terms of your, of your uh, uh, administration and, and um, funding and so forth. That mean if group A gets sued, then group B may be liable. So for that reason, the local interest groups like Bay Area Skeptics were uh, independent of the nationals. And, but 
the 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 point I, I don't want to distract from the point that Steve is making because it's it's absolutely essential. There has been a real revolution in skepticism as a result of web-based communication. Yeah, absolutely. What, what changed the? Um, you're saying the Bay Area skeptics. Mm -hmm could not actually be part of the larger group? Because not the legally. Was not there legally. Any legal changes that occurred? No. Um, the Bay Area Skeptics is it's a separate corporation. We're incorporated in California. Uh, we've been around, like I say, since 1981. And we have... Um, we have a publication and we have meetings and we have local now we have skeptics in the pub you know yeah, I mean, right, yeah. <laughs> we're also using uh, uh, the meeting but there are several other skeptics groups around the com country that were formed in the 1980s and 90s and um they uh, you know the um What's, what's the group in, in uh, North Texas? The North Texas um, oh, skeptics. Uh, yeah. New Mexicans for Science and Reason, that's another mm -hmm. really strong group. There's a number of these local interest groups that were inspired by PSYCOP. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes PSYCOP would um, provide a mailing list. That's how Sherman got started. Yeah. Yeah. There was a Southern California skeptics yeah. group. <clears throat> Sometimes the nationals would, would allow you a one-time uh, use of their mailing list. You could write the the members of PSYCOP in your area and say, we're going to be forming a local group. Are you interested? And that's one way for you. Right. But so much easier now with uh, web communications because you can meet, you, you can reach such a larger potential group of people uh, beyond just those who subscribe to Skeptical Inquirer right. or subscribe to the skeptic, except that Sherma doesn't loan his list, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's funny. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's been a very interesting decade. Yeah, oh, it, it has been. Yeah, and, and like I, we were getting involved with our own group. Uh, and I said, you know, Psychop, and they didn't quite know what to do with us. They actually, at that time, they were just sort of recognizing that they were missing something. Now, I mean, before. They wanted to they wanted to organize with yeah. the local groups, but they didn't know how, and they were still wanted to keep us at arm's length, yeah, but help did. us out. And it was weird because they wanted to keep that layer of protection. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, but they weren't able to really provide us what we needed for that reason, which before, was infrastructure. But now we don't need the infrastructure because we have the web. Basically. Before we may, might be further confusing some people because it's only been a couple years because yeah. PSYCOP doesn't exist anymore. It's now it's CFI. CSI. CSI. The, the name PSYCOP yeah. doesn't well, exist. Well, there's, there's actually, to, to make it more confusing, there's yeah. the Center for Inquiry, yeah. the CFI, which is essentially a rationalist organization that combines skepticism and secular humanism. The, the CSI, the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, is just the skeptical end of the spectrum. Yeah, right? so those two were what Psychop was. CSI no, was no, Psychop. Actually, oh, actually, that's not true. Yeah. Psychop was always just the skeptics. Group. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. And okay. it was, um, and back in the day. Back in the day. <laughs> in the beginning, <laughs> as we oh, tend right. to say in my line of work. Um, Book Paul one. Kurtz was a board member of the American Humanist Association. Yeah. There was a falling out between Paul and the board. And so Paul left the board and he founded this. Uh, Secular Humanist. The Center f um, for Democratic and Secular Humanism, Kodesh, that was the okay. ancestor of um, the present humanist organization. Uh, so he formed his own humanist organization. That was kind of at the same time that, that Sagan and Gardner and Asimov and these other guys were saying, you know, we need to do something about all the crazy pseudoscientific stuff that's going on, astrology and all the rest that's going on in our society. And Kurtz was part of that group. And so he helped, as, as Steve was saying, he helped to yeah. form the, you know, be, be the organized person among yeah. that group of, of cats that needed hurting. Um, <laughs> We're all just and, cats. Uh, and, well, butterflies is actually a better analogy. Oh, that's better. Opinion, I like that. But, um, they're even harder then, to hurt in three dimensions. I don't want to be netted. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but then you're beautiful. Okay. It that way. All right. So um, there, there have always been two separate organizations, PSYCOP and a humanist organization that's changed in name a, a lot okay. of years. Then in the late 80s, 90s, I forget. <clears throat> I can remember better the, you know, the Miocene and the Oligocene than I can remember the 80s and 90s. But um, <laughs> the uh, uh, we'll chart it at some point. The, the Center for Inquiry was formed as an umbrella organization right. to house the secular humanists and the skeptics group. But the two groups are administratively separate, although there have certainly been efforts to try to bring them together, and which have been opposed mightily by many of us to try to keep them apart. Right. Um, but they are, you know, CFI is the umbrella, then the two groups underneath it. Yeah, that was but, the late 90s, because at the time, yeah. 
Kurtz actually summoned the local groups to <laughs> Buffalo to have a meeting of the local groups, and it, eventually we realized, oh, he's just trying to sell us on this whole CFI idea. <laughs> That's what this is all about. And we actually didn't like it, because we, we didn't want to be united with the secular humanists, because we had, not that we don't share a world view, but we have an agenda that's, that is different, a focus that's different, and we wanted to keep the sort of purity of our focus. And uh, there was, you know, also the, the, um, the, the, the Psychop insiders who were on the skeptical end saying, yeah, this isn't a good thing for us because, you know, because the, 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 the humanists are going to suck all the oxygen out of the room because that's what happens up in <laughs> Buffalo. That was, They're that's, so friendly. No, I'm saying, I mean, what I mean was they, they, that is what was happening in Buffalo at the time, they, yeah. that they were getting all the juice and, and they were afraid that the skeptics were going to be sort of the neglected, forgotten half of that equation. Stepchild. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and well, you know, well, Kurtz's heart is really with the. That's humanists. exactly why, because Kurtz, Kurtz's heart is with the humanists, and yeah, and he was, yeah. you know, the, the leader of the whole thing. So they said mm -hmm. this isn't a good thing for Psychop, and therefore, by extension, the local skeptical groups who want to, you know, organize or ally with Psychop. So, so we. Thanks, but no thanks. So yeah, and and he wasn't happy with that answer, but that's. That's what happened. And that actually, that fight kept, I think, occurring within the inner bowels of, of PSYCOP, you know, now CSI, mm -hmm. over the next decade. And, and it's pretty much resolved now, but after while that was, yeah, after the, yeah, exactly, Kurtz is, is, no, is out now, but, but while they were sort of distracted by that fight, Again, the Web 2.0 hit, yeah. and then everyone, I think, just started ignoring them because they were, we just started organizing ourselves through the internet. Mm -hmm. And now that they, are, I think, have settled down and, and have more clarity of vision and organization, they're trying to get back into it and like, really become a national group again and reconnect with the local groups. And you know, so To their credit, they're really trying to play catch-up now, uh, and they're doing it in a lot of ways. But they did lose, I think, a decade. You know, because of what well, was happening. The, the concentration at, at PSYCOP slash CSI, some of us old timers have trouble <laughs> calling it CSI still. Um, th their, their concentration has always been the Skeptical Inquirer, the, the, the magazine, right. uh, which is an excellent magazine, and, and we all refer to it and we all get our information from it. But uh, yeah, I, I think you're right that, that they were a little slow to adapt yeah. to the web, but that's changing. Yeah, I remember Barry Carr, who who was one of, like the executive director of CSI. I told him what a podcast was. He hadn't didn't know mm -hmm. until I informed him. Mm -hmm. It's like, what have you been doing, Steve? You have like dropped off the face of the earth. Like, well, I'm doing this podcast thing. You haven't heard? It? You haven't seen that? You have no idea. You have no idea. Mm -hmm. But now they have their own podcast, and they're they're yeah. they're they're, they're so. trying very hard to get yeah to get. To get caught up to this, you know, the internet wave that that hit the skeptical movement about five or six years I think, ago. I think he's here. Hey, Barry. This year, isn't he? I haven't seen he? Barry. The CSI is here. No, no, yeah, I, thought, I thought I saw. Yeah. Did I see Barry? I thought I thought. But I saw Barry. you know, think think again about the difference between a national organization like CSI and a local organization like Bay Area Skeptics or the New England Skeptics or something like that. Um, Bay Area Skeptics is run by volunteers. I assume do you have paid all, staff. No, all volunteer, and, all and, with and day I, jobs. I yeah. don't know of any of the local uh, interest groups, we'll call them the regional groups, um, that have paid staff. Uh, we basically exist on donations. Sometimes we'll have memberships. We're small potatoes organizations. Oh, yeah. um, Bay Area Skeptics has been around the longest. We have no question waxed and waned in terms of the amount of activity that's gone on. Um, the Bay Area Skeptics information sheet, BASIS, our newsletter, has, <laughs> um, has had a, a checkered career of actually being published and then not having been published for a couple of years and then published again. And, and and you know, there, it's. I'm not apologizing for it. It's the nature right. of uh, of uh, volunteer associations. That's very different when you have a publication like the Skeptical Inquirer. You have a paid staff. You have people who are supposed to be doing things and who are carrying out projects. When you are a professional nonprofit, you have to you have to have money. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to have memberships. You uh, you have to publish that uh, journal. And you have to be organized about it. You can't just take a couple year hiatus like the Bay Area Skeptics can do. So, uh, you know, it's very easy for us as regional groups to exploit the web. You don't get a lot of money from the web, folks. Um, <laughs> 
it tends to uh, it, it, it brings Spurs. people into your meetings. You know, I mean, yeah. we we've had wonderful skeptics in the pub at uh, in the Bay Area skeptics. I'm president of Bay Area skeptics. Taking off my National Center for Science Education hat here. Um, We've, we've managed to increase the number of people who've uh, learned about Bay Area skeptics, who've learned about skepticism. Um, we started out rebuilding BAS about two years ago with skeptics in the pub, using the kinds of yeah. uh, Web 2.0 that Steve was, was talking about. And now we, we really do have a pretty good mass of people that have been coming regularly to our skeptics in the pubs. And now we have just instituted, as of, as of this month, um, uh, meetings in the East Bay and meetings in the San Francisco Peninsula area. It's, it's quite a large, yeah, spread out area. Um, you know, every other week, um, you know, we, we meet in, in one side of the bay or the other. And sometimes it's skeptics in the pub, sometimes it's a skept talk. Sometimes it's actually a presentation where it's not just a social occasion, but we're actually trying to spread more information about the kinds of topics that we're concerned about. So um, we can do that very informally, and, but, but it really does depend on how much energy you have in the, um, in the local group and whether the officers of the local group uh, are willing to take the time and the effort many times away from their day jobs and so forth to do, to do this sort of thing. So it's, um, you know, I, I'm delighted to see the national organizations starting to exploit the web resources mm -hmm, yeah. uh, to, to a greater degree. Right. Well, they're all, I mean, even some of the quote-unquote national groups seem bigger because of the web than they really mm -hmm. are. Like at TAM, mm -hmm. the Skeptic Society, we have their, our, basically we all go to dinner, that's the all-hands meeting, that's everybody, mm -hmm. all of us. Mm -hmm. It's like six of us. You know, it's me and Robin and Shermer and Pat Lindsay and, you know, Daniel and that's it. Mm -hmm. That's everybody. Mm -hmm. you know, everybody else is just, just writers who they call stuff right. from. Right. So even the bigger groups, even the national big ones, if you look at the actual staff, they're the like... The CSI staff is not very large. Yeah, yeah. Even though it's huge, but <clears throat> it's not that big as people. Uh, a question. Yeah, moving sort of beyond the administrative part of skepticism. I was wondering if you could give us your perspective on what might be a top ten hit list of things that you would, you know, attitudes you want to change. Things like creationism, mm. obviously there's some energy devoted to trying to debunk that worldview. But I was wondering if you had any uh, other topics that you think, you know, come up. Is there like a top ten list of Oh. Of, uh, Start with you'd medical. Like to, that, those that you'd like to at the top of the list. Yeah. have people be skeptical about. Yeah, I mean, definitely. The, the, I'm a physician, right? If you don't know, don't know that, but so it's hard to get out of my area of expertise. I'm biased, but I do think that pseudoscience in medicine is huge. It, the other side is extremely well funded because uh, snake oil sells. It makes a lot of money. So there's just an economics to it. The, the groups that are selling the snake oil are, have millions of dollars to fund their propaganda, their efforts. There's you know, the, a, the Brave World collaboration, which literally goes to medical schools and says, we'll give you a million dollars to open up a clinic to promote alternative medicine. Yeah. And what medical school is going to give that up? It's a million, here, here you go. So they, they can literally bribe their way into medical schools. We don't, we don't have a million dollars to give to medical schools to not do that or to, to, to open up a center for critical thinking in medicine. You know, we have to sort of make our case totally from the ground up. And so the, the game is massively rigged against us. The same thing with the, uh, the anti-vax movement. There, it says that's a smaller, you know, than the, than the bigger, although they're, they're very closely allied, you know, conceptually with the alternative medicine movement. They're also well-funded. It's amazing to me how much money these, these organizations uh, can, can get. To not do, you having, have to disclose it. Not having ethics? Makes you a lot of money. No, I mean, well, but sir, some of them are really true believers in yeah. the efficacy well, of these well, traits. I mean, you, you don't have to accuse them of being unethical. The, the anti-vaxxers <laughs> sell you know, alternative medicine products. You go to their website, and they're selling snake oil. So they, they make a lot of money off of that as well. So they, they also have, they, I, I do think they, they believe what they're saying, but at the same time, it's very convenient because then they can say, well, you know, they, they oppose mainstream medicine and science and 
Um, the demonization yeah. of uh, so Western So what's the alternative? <laughs> well, okay, so let's sell you our natural herbs and whatever else they're selling, and, and these two things go hand in hand. So that's definitely number one on, on my hit list. I was just saying with the JREF, you know, re recognize this is an important <laughs> issue. Um, you know, obviously the creation evolution debate is hugely important. You could... Well, it, it's, yeah, I mean, as, as a symbol of a number of things. Exactly. Right? I think it, it um, is the... I mean, but... Yeah, education. It, that's why you're the National yeah, Center for Science yeah. Education. This right. is this... The, I think the primary issue in this country, but it's the bigger issue of, I think, keeping science and education free from ideological influence. As far as this, as far as the, what skeptics should be concerned about, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm a little hoarse today. I was talking a lot tomorrow, uh, yesterday at uh, uh, our booth, and my, my voice is a little scratchy, but that's why they make microphones, right? Um, I think as far as the skeptics are concerned, think about the things that hurt people. Uh, that that should be your first target area, and th this is why I, you know, pointed to Steve when when uh, uh, to start answering your question because the medical uh, quackery and the medical uh, practices which are not efficacious do hurt people, and if we can somehow help educate our fellow citizens about how to think about. Um, evaluating these claims uh, because the, the claims are very persuasive. I mean, there are poisons in our medicine and uh, who wouldn't want to have uh, a more benign sounding medication that doesn't have all those horrible side effects that are listed on the uh, pharmaceutical sheet that you get along with your, your pills. The one I love the best is sudden death. Well, if you have that, you're not going to call your doctor. <laughs> call your doctor if you experience sudden death. That's a hell of a death. side effect. I, I heard I mean, that I don't want to take that pill. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I confess to being very medicine uh, uh, averse. I'm, I'm fortunate that for whatever reason I got a set of genes that uh, uh, enable me to adapt to my environment in a very healthy fashion. I'm very rarely sick and I'm lucky in that regard. And so I, I really hate taking medications. Um, I got shingles a couple summers ago, by the way. If any of you are over 60, get the damn shot. I don't care how expensive it is. You don't want to have shingles. It's awful. It's, it's, and basically, that's the, the mega chicken box, basically. Oh, oh it's awful. It's, um, uh, but uh, I was one of the fortunate, what percent, 15 or 20 percent, that gets something called post-herpetic neuralgia, which is sort of the continuation of the pain after the you know, shingle stuff goes away. So I have to continue to take a, uh, a particular um, very strong anticonvulsive medicine that happens as a side effect to be a very good pain reliever. So, so I'm really grumpy about having to take these damn pills three times a day. And I'm trying very hard to cut down on them because I don't like the side effects. Um, the side effects as described in this medication, it, it affects your concentration. I need this. I think for a living, right? I don't need to be any dumber than I already am because of you know, advancing old age. So, you know, long story, a lot of people don't want to take medications because of the side effects. I don't either. So it's very attractive when somebody provides a safe way of dealing with this uh, you know, terrible medical condition that you have or whatever pain you have and so forth. I can feel lots of sympathy for people. But what we need to do is try to increase the habits of thinking about how do I really know that this particular you know, uh, offering to me to uh, as a medication or as a practice is really going to make me better, uh, really, really going to um, help my condition. How do we increase critical thinking? And of course, that kind of, of practice can be directed in a lot of, a lot of different places. I think concentrating on the things that really hurt people are important. But you know, something like, like belief in ghosts. Um, in one sense, that's kind of trivial because, you know, okay, you believe in ghosts, all right, you have a little grip on reality here. But can we get somebody like that to think about, you know, how do I evaluate the claims that, this, that, that the neighbors next door have a ghost in their attic? How, how would I think about this problem? Because frankly, people who believe in ghosts and people who believe in a lot of these other pseudoscientific uh, uh, enthusiasms that we're familiar with live in a very different world than we do. Uh, they, they and, and actually there's some survey research on this, 
they live in a, in a world in which they are not really in control of their future. Uh, they live in a world in which fate, uh, as it is often defined, uh, chance, things that they have no control over, um, are very influential uh, to, to their futures. Well, I would not like to, you know, live in a world like that. I mean, I, I would not like to, mm -hmm. I, I think people are happy if they feel that, that what they can do can make a difference in what, what, how they live their lives and, and what will happen to them. And if you have this, if you are surrounded by this cloud of pseudoscience that an unfortunate number of Americans really are, you know, it also is, uh, is something that can hurt you. Uh, maybe more right. psychologically than physically in terms of the medical things we've been talking about. But yeah. I think you know. I think there's there's a lot of targets for us. There's a lot of targets. Yeah. So for the, us. there's a yeah. So there's many many things on the list of superstitious or paranormal things people believe in, where the belief itself, you know, may not be directly harmful, but mm -hmm. it's more it's like the like the ghost hunting shows. Who do they harm? It's just you know really. In my opinion, crappy entertainment, but some people like to watch it. I would rather watch paint dry personally. But the uh, but what the problem with that is that it's teaching people misinformation about the scientific process. Mm -hmm. So it's teaching them to be pseudoscientists, you know, to be gullible in certain ways and to, to have a misunderstanding, a misconception about how the process of science works. It's like, okay, if you have a fancy looking instrument and you're measuring something, you're doing science. No, that's, that's not what science is. Science is having testable hypotheses and considering alternatives, all the stuff that they're not doing on those shows. So it's not the ghost belief that's the problem, it's the, it's the, uh, the destruction of the understanding of the, you know, the public understanding of science. The, the, the details are, are changing, whether it's UFOs, ghosts, Bigfoot, well, th those are all equivalent in my mind. They're all just different, way, different manifestations of the same phenomenon of teaching pseudoscience versus teaching people to understand how science actually works. So then when the global warming debate comes along and we're having a public debate about policy that actually does matter, and the public doesn't understand how science works, and they have, you know, they're filled with all these misconceptions, and it's really hard to try to convince them of what the scientific consensus is and why the, that's the, the scientific consensus, because they're watching ghost shows, and it's, mis, it's misinforming them about the nature of science. So we blame the ghost hunters for, I mean, Ghostbusters movie for all the weird gadgets. <laughs> and I'm saying, I'm at science, damn it. I love that movie. <laughs> See? That's why. But it did create a lot of those memes, though. Yeah, it yeah, did. Yeah. I mean, before then, nobody had, like, yeah. weird gadgets <laughs> like this. Oh, I saw, I see a ghost. And then suddenly you have people with, like, oh, what is that? Well, uh, an EF reader. Oh, boy, no. <laughs> it's, that's, it's not built to detect a ghost. It's trying to find leaks in your electrical system. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another question. Yes, um, we were talking earlier about um, lawsuits and having to do with that. Please don't sue me. Yeah, <laughs> not today. Okay. Um, is there anything we can take a look at the lesson of what happened with um, Cult Watch and how not only was it sued out of existence, but it was um, the name was taken and is now a puppet of Scientology. Scientology. Is there anything we can look at to see what happened there that we can avoid or just how we can fight back or anything like that. There might be a lot of people here who don't know what he's talking about. Yeah. It, it was Cult, in, not Cult Info, I think was the name of the group. There was a, a Cult Awareness group. Uh, might have been you know, yeah. Cult Awareness Network. Yeah, well, but I, think, like I think he's right about the domain. I thought it was Cult Watch. It was a Cult Watch. So there was, a, was. A, a, essentially a, a group whose purpose was to be a watchdog group on cults, especially dangerous cults, and to help people get out of cults, keep them from getting, becoming victimized by cults. And they uh, were sued by Scientology uh, oh, for, figure. I think, trying to extract somebody from, from Scientology. And the Scientologists won the lawsuit, because that's what they do. And they, they actually, you know, the, the result of that was the cult awareness group went into bankruptcy, and therefore Scientology ended up taking everything that they owned, not only their domain name and their name, but also all their files, their offices, everything. So now if you call the Cult Awareness Network, whatever the, the phone number is, you get a Scientologist on the yeah. other end of the phone telling you how awful you are for trying to interfere with the religious freedom of your child because you want to get them out of a cult. And then they'll say, do you want to get clear? Do you want to get clear? Come in, we'll, get, we'll read your engrams and we'll, we'll straighten you out. So, th that's a, yeah, that was a horrible situation. I, you know, the, the threat of lawsuit for, for, um, for libel and slander, it's always hovering over the skeptical movement. It really is, because we're engaged in confronting 
uh, not only you know cranks and charlatans, but of, oftentimes also uh, a con artists. With money. Yeah, con, yeah, they, yeah. Oh. But, but I think, but like sociopathic con artists who are hiding among the true believing charlatans, and their primary weapon against us is intimidation and lawsuits, and it's 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 unfortunately effective. Um, there are generic ways to protect yourself, you know. Don't make any factual claims that you that you don't know are true. You know, be be and, and sometimes all you have to do is say, in my opinion, and you've pretty much covered yourself because now you're saying your opinion. You're not making a factual statement that could be proven incorrect. But anyway, there's there's those generic things that you have to we have to educate ourselves about how. But in my opinion, can be libel. It can be, but or I mean, slander, it, so. can, it, it 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 yeah. there's there yeah there's no just, proof. Just don't libel and slander. Yeah, there's no proof against being sued though. Even if you so the one the so st step one is don't actually libel or slander slander people. <laughs> step two is you can still be sued even if you never do that because it's the suit itself that's the intimidation factor, not their ability to win the suit. Um, and this is more of a problem in the UK, where just getting sued can cost hundreds of thousands of millions, of whatever. Incredible, you know, the Simon Singh episode can cost a lot of money. Yeah. It's not as bad in the US. Uh, but I think we also do need to get savvy about it. And there are organizations that are that are that are um, coming into existence that where you can essentially get you know insurance against being sued and sort of spread out and share the risk, so that if you do get sued, it's not going to ruin your organization. You're not going to end up going bankrupt or having to close up shop. Most I know you. You know me. It's the, wolf, it's the wolf mother. Yes, that's right. Um, so, Steve, you Is and I have, yeah, well, I'm also a physician, you know, and yeah. I'm, I'm emergency, so I see what happens when people, they don't, they take their herbal remedies and then they come see me uh, because, of course, it doesn't work. And then they still think their herbal stuff yeah. works, and I'm like, why are you here then if that works? So, all right, that's, um, I haven't had any coffee, <laughs> so I digress. I'm sorry. But um, I know that I have, I'm only just like the past couple of years come into the skeptical movement, even though I was always kind of a skeptic, didn't know it, this all existed. That was here a couple it of years ago. It was here three years ago. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, so, um, but once I found, oh my gosh, these are my people. So anyway, <laughs> um, my I, I have begun to make inroads in my professional organization, at least on a national level. I'm still having problems at a local level, and I've been amazed at how resistant some of my colleagues who are scientists, or at least scientifically right. trained, um, how they they are still buying into a lot of these alt med, excuse me, alt med cures, acupuncture. I had a very heated discussion with a very high-ranking member in the American College of Emergency Physicians, who is a true believer in acupuncture yeah. and in meat allergies. I mean, I, I don't really understand his his position on that. But uh, anyway, and there are people who are doing the alt med research. Right. So there is a question in the future, I promise. So uh, anyway, I have I have begun to experience this as a challenge. I know you've been very successful at Yale in um, helping to open eyes of some of your colleagues. I would yeah. love to hear your experience. And then from Jeannie, yesterday Massimo um, Pagliucci said that you were his biggest challenge in his <laughs> career. And it ended up, of course, you were right and he was yeah, wrong. He said but that. He absolutely did. I told her yesterday. But anyway, so I'm, I would love to hear what your biggest challenge has been as well. Um, do you want me to start, I guess? So, the, the yeah, at Yale, there, uh, the, the, I'm fighting my the, my local battle against the infiltration of pseudoscience into the medical school education, and unfortunately, the the medical student uh, association, the AMSA, American Medical Student Association, you know, is um, very pro, like pro alternative medicine. Be, so. They have an influence. We're, we're trying to get medical students in there who are on the skeptical end of the spectrum to balance things out a little bit better. The thing is, that, you know, what I find in medicine is that 95% of my colleagues just don't care. They're just not. It's like it's that they're yeah, shruggies. So busy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they just it's off their radar. They don't know what it is. They don't care. It's like oh, that's all that touchy feely stuff. Fine, whatever makes you feel good. You know, my but, company is the same way for yeah. many things. Yeah, like they could they could go after it because they know it's untrue. But, but like, there's you know, the like they don't the care. one two three percent who are true believers who are very vocal and active and then get a very disproportionate effect. And then there's the similar you know numbers that are that are skeptical, but they find it very difficult to know what to do. You know, in response. But most just don't know, don't care. Seriously, that's that. You probably have the same experience. So that's really what we're confronting. So the, the you have the disproportionate, you know, uh, the, the the minority, but having a very disproportionate effect in the American Medical Student Association. They actually were influenced the accreditation organization. So that I don't know if you knew this, but medical schools now have to include 
uh, the teaching of alternative medicine in their curriculum in order to get accredited. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I went to my dean and said, why are we doing this? He said, we have to because that's a part of now of, of accreditation. Hmm. It doesn't mean you have to teach it gullibly. Say, yeah, they, you don't have to, you could still, you could <laughs> teach it. There's an advantage there. Oh, yeah, so I said, oh, that's they, fine. They lemonade at this yeah, point. Yeah, exactly. We, yeah. That's fine. I'm, I'm happy to teach this course for you, but you know, we'll <laughs> do it. under toxins. Yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll do it under, Steve, we'll let, do let it scientifically. Steve watch out for the furries. <laughs> yeah, yeah, watch out so, for the furries. <laughs> so that's sort of been my struggle now that's for years. I'll try to give you the short version of the story. I'm on the curriculum committee, and the uh, the first sort of proposal for a alternative medicine little mini course you know came up. Do a demonstration of homeopathy. Well, I mean, the, and so who are they going to get to teach these classes? Well, we want to teach about acupuncture, so you get an acupuncturist to no. teach her. No, no, you don't, that's not what you should do. But that's the, what because everyone else doesn't care and doesn't know. So that's the problem. That's the problem. So who you could go? To, so yeah. they have the, the the and the the proponents are very aggressive and very happy to be all, so helpful. Yeah, we'll write the whole thing thing for you. Sure. We'll do all the work for you. So the local naturopaths were all over it and everything. They had this, you know, eight course, eight class, you know, curriculum. And at the meeting where we were reviewing the material, I was trying to impress upon my colleagues, you know, what How was really you? happening. And I took the time to investigate in detail one of the outsiders they were going to bring in to teach a class. And the guy's a nut job, <laughs> right? Just to put it, to, to, to cut to the chase. And I'm explaining to, to them. Not to libel or slander, mind you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm in the in <laughs> So, I didn't mention Not his name. Any names. Not mentioning right, any names. Right, right. I said, listen, this guy is selling snake oil on his website. He's promoting all this kinds of nonsense. And they literally said, well, maybe, you know, in his private, you know, you know practice he's doing that, but that's not what he's going to be teaching. I'm like, well, how could you say that? Can we crack open the curriculum and see what's in there? So I'm trying to explain to them what the whole alternative medicine thing was about. And, the, and, and they were like, you know, nodding their heads and, you know, being polite. And then eventually, at the time, we, for a while, we didn't think that we had the actual curriculum, but then said somebody figured out that we did. So we cracked open the curriculum, and I was what the, the cardiologist, the first class was going to be on cardiology. And the cardiologist was reading through the thing. So we're ha having our conversation while he's reading through it. And about five minutes later, he looks up and goes, this is all Bullshit. Yes. 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 <laughs> I'm like, ding, 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 ding. Yes. Hello. What have I been saying for the last hour? And then after the meeting, we're standing by the elevator, and he confessed to me. He goes, you know, I didn't believe you until I read the curriculum. Okay. I, he Trust thought, but verify. He thought I was a, like a Cassandra, that I was like being hysterical. Yeah, He's yeah, like, yeah. no, because they, they, it's so bad. It's like nobody wants to believe. It's like telling somebody who doesn't know what homeopathy is. They go, no. Yeah. It can't be that stupid. How could it? No, you're wrong. You're yeah. wrong. It can't be that stupid. It's like no. I, well, this is what it is. Nothing but like providing people evidence. Yeah. yeah. We, we so did. that's the struggle. It's just is yeah. showing our colleagues how yeah. actually stupid yeah. this all is. Because frankly, just telling them isn't good enough. I mean, yeah. th th this is this is our we're you know oral creatures. Our first inclination <laughs> is just to tell people. Yeah. You know these people. Uh, you know th this. Uh, cure or this suggestion, this modality, doesn't work. Right. Um, but it's even more. It's even stronger if you can say, well, there was a study done and published in X Y Z journal that uh, under controlled conditions showed that this didn't work. I can get you a copy of that. Yeah. Yeah. Because then it's not just you, you know, who is obviously uh, frantic and and not not reliable. Um, <laughs> But, look but at it's, him. But it's look a peer wild eyed. <laughs> yeah. It's a it's it's an authoritative a more right, author right. authoritative source. But joking aside, that's that's what they do is they try to portray mm -hmm. us as the hysterics, as we are the ones who are, have an axe to grind or who are very emotional about the topic. And that's it's why it's easy to get there. It's easy. Well, that's right. Yeah. I think it's like, Eugenie, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that one of the main strategies mm -hmm. of the creationists is to say things that are so outrageous that they get scientists riled up. Then they go, see how riled up they are? No, no, they, they don't even need to try. Yeah, yeah, but, but, see, but, they, but I think that, that just happens. See, we're tools of the medical it's industrial not, complex, though. So, <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're just we're, we're biased. Right, but right. see, you're assuming that your colleagues are rational and logical and yeah. that you will tell them what is the situation they'll go I see that's not what they're people True. Yeah. and as people 
um, they are going to want to hang on to their biases, which they have, mm -hmm. you know, cultivated over the years mm -hmm. and, and feel confident in. And I've always admired your ability to still see that even through the bullshit. Right. So <laughs> I would love That's to acquire good. more of that. So, so what is your big, biggest challenge, Ben? Oh, well, uh, gosh, I mean, I've been doing this for 25 years, so where do I start? <laughs> I mean, well, how about how from, about your present one? From 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 an um, you know from a uh, administrative uh, standpoint, keeping the money coming in so I don't have to lay off staff. I mean, yeah. what we do at NCSE is provide brains. I mean, we we provide informed people to um, help local citizens in dealing with these the, the issue of teaching evolution. So I need I need human beings on my staff who can do this work. It can't just be done through the written word. I need I need people. And that means I need to keep them paid, and that means I need to keep the money coming in, and fundraising is the least pleasant aspect of my work. Uh, I, I don't do it nearly as often or as well as I should, but, which is why we're not as big as the Institute for Creation Research, <laughs> among other reasons. You don't have saddles um, for your dinos? Probably our biggest, um, our biggest challenge was the Dover year. Yeah. Um, so Kitzmiller versus Dover. 2004? The, um, yeah, but you guys kicked ass, though. Yeah, you did. Yes, yeah, you did it, kick it ass. Was not, not by accident. I mean, it that was, was, that was badass. And it was, it was work of the whole staff. I mean, yeah. um, it was a realization to me of, of what a campaign a big trial actually is. Mm -hmm. I mean, over the years, I've advised on three or four different legal teams. But this was the first time when the, um, the Dover Intelligent Design Policy was passed. This was the first time that um, I and my organization were involved in, in building the legal team, finding the expert witnesses, helping to prepare the expert witnesses, helping to prepare the, the lawyers to be able to ask the questions and be able to deal with the science. Um, the lawyers were, were uh, extremely generous um, uh, after the trial and, and uh, subsequently when they give talks on this topic, as we all have. Uh, they have said that you know, we could not have litigated this trial successfully without NCSE. I mean, that doesn't warm our hearts. <laughs> that but there, I mean, it was a whole year of prep. To, to, to do this case. Yeah. The case was six weeks and people think, oh wow, that was a really long trial. Yeah, yeah that yeah. and the year of preparation. <laughs> right. yeah. And um, my staff was basically divided up to, to concentrate on preparing information on the specific expert witnesses. Um, so uh, Wes Ellsbury was the specialist in Bill Dembski, for example. Um, and we had other people too. And then, the you know, all this preparation that these guys did, um, full uh, documentation of their positions over the years, how it's changed, or what the scientific flaws were. I mean, a hell of a lot of work was done by all of my, my staff members. And then, uh, you know, most of the expert witnesses dropped from the other side, and they're all dressed up with no place to go. It was really disappointing, because <laughs> they'd done all this work, and you know, now there's no deposition, right? But um, it was, it was nerve-wracking, it was exhausting, and uh, just reinforced all of my prejudices that the absolutely last thing that we want to do is go to court. Uh, I mean, we, you know, we felt Dover was a failure for us because we were not able to solve that problem before things got so bad that a court case was the only way to, to deal with it. But it was the nature of the school board. But you know, mo most of the time, we work behind the scenes, and it doesn't get into the newspaper. I mean, that, that's when we really succeed, is when you never hear about it. Yeah. Uh, but boy, everybody heard about Dover, and well, fortunately, that, it turned out the yeah. right way. I think that's true if you're looking at it from just the legal point of view. But I think from a public outreach point well, of view, but Dover but was a huge. Specific, uh, yeah, but I think that Dover was a success <laughs> in that it, it really oh, yeah. captured the public attention. Oh, yeah. And again, you, you kicked ass, and, and that, that stands as sort of an icon of, yeah, intelligent design. Yeah, those guys were the nut jobs who lost in, in Dover, but it's just warmed over creation. And that's basically yeah, what they yeah, demonstrated. So yeah, I think for pub, for public perception, it was oh, a, no, it was yeah, a big yeah, win, absolutely. big win. But yeah. in most cases, if you've got a school board situation, yeah. and maybe one or more of the school board members is uh, wanting to propose something that's a bad idea, generally speaking, uh, we have more success if we get um, a community member. Um, 
prepare that community member with the right kind of information and the right kind of approach to go to that school board member off camera, so to speak, yeah. uh, and try to persuade that school board member as to why the policy is a bad idea or why the practice shouldn't be instituted. Because once it hits the newspaper, then po positions get polarized. It's very difficult to compromise. And, you know, guys, we live in a democracy. Compromise is necessary. Uh, we can't just walk in and say, this is science, do it this way. <laughs> it doesn't work that way in a democracy. Um, so we have to persuade our opponents to take our point of view, or at least persuade um, the people who are decision makers that our point of view is the one that the direction they should go because most of the voters in the community disagree with it. Most of the time that's a much stronger argument than the actual science, I'm sorry to say. Uh, but that's because my particular issue does deal so specifically with politics. You but in terms of skepticism in general, the kinds of, of uh, uh, issues that we often deal with in our community groups or just you as individuals writing a letter to the newspaper or something, that's not going to be a concern. Right. Educating the public is really what it's all about. So if your question, we have about Half a minute. Is it a yes or no question? Not really. All right, give it. A, do it anyway. It's the last question. So. Um, give us so, something to think about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking about every now and then in in sort of the skeptic music me movement as a whole, um, the term ad hominem gets gets thrown around a lot, and I find it very useful in certain circumstances and completely inappropriate in others, mm -hmm. um, because I think there are situations where the only thing that makes sense to do is to illustrate that, you know, the person themselves, like, can't represent the evidence accurately or, or things like that. And I was interested to hear your guys' thoughts on sort of when it makes more sense to attack the argument and when it makes more sense to show that just that the person who's making the argument is completely misrepresenting things or doesn't know what they're talking about. Well, sometimes that's the same thing. Um, remember... It's a democracy. Our job is to persuade people to our point of view. We can't just hit them over the head. Um, I don't know that I'd want to, although it's much more effective. All right, we, we have to persuade people to our point of view. What's the most effective way of persuading people? Um, we like to have people thinking clearly, thinking critically, so we should be modeling the sort of behavior we want them to use. Um, also, uh, if you and, and so, therefore, I would attack the argument rather than the person. The other reason for focusing on the argument is not just modeling what we want them to do. If you take an ad hominem approach, if you're attacking the person, the bearer of the information, uh, a lot of people in the creationist, or the evolution side of the creation evolution controversy will say, oh, Duane Gish or Henry Morris were liars. Okay, that an ad hominem argument. I would focus on what Duane Gish and Henry Morris say rather than attacking them. When you attack your opponent, you make them a martyr. In the United States, um, we love underdogs. Yeah, I was about to say that. And you are going to <laughs> yeah. get more ammunition for your opponent by making your opponent an underdog. So model the behavior we want people to use. Right. We want them to be critical thinkers. Focus on the argument. That would be my suggestion. Yeah, I think there are, there are two cases when you would bring in sort of personal information. One is when a person is making claims about themselves, like if a charlatan is yes. claiming to have a degree they don't have, yes. or expertise not. they don't have, it's okay to point out, no, that's not true, actually. Mm -hmm. This is, they don't have the expertise they claim to have. So it's like, you know, like in the court of law, if you raise a point, now it's fair game to counter that point. The other time is when there's a historical information that just has to be out there to put things into context. You know, Kevin Trudeau was convicted of fraud. You may want to know that information before you assess the the reliability of the information he's trying to sell you, uh, or, or Dennis Lee has you know, been convicted of fraud, has been banned from doing business in certain states because he's a menace to the investing public. This is I background like that. information that is helpful in people assessing the menace reliability the yeah, of, of the person that you're dealing with rather than, they want, sometimes they want you to just narrow down on the little claim because that they're trying to put you in an arena where they have a psychological advantage and sometimes it's helpful to step outside and they go, let's look at the big picture here. So those are the two times where we'll go there because um, I think it's, it's necessary for, for context. Yeah. But watch out that you don't make your opponents minds. Yeah, I agree with that, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming out in the, for the middle of the morning, the middle of the morning, the early morning. <laughs> <laughs>